that is unit number seven, which is actually your uh, uh, under the part three. So we are you are going to learn unit seven, eight, and nine. Here we are going to discuss production function. Then in eight we are going to discuss cost functions, and uh, nine also we are going to discuss long run cost functions. Today we are going to uh, discuss uh, that is uh, um, production function unit seven. Now here block three as I told. It introduces production and cost. Seven production function and its building blocks. Eight and nine cost analysis and long run cost functions, etc. Now, what is a production? Production process involves transformation of inputs into output. Basically, that is the idea. It's a technical relationship between inputs and output. The inputs could be land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, etc. And the output. Could be uh, goods and services, any type of goods. In a production process, manager takes four types of decisions: whether to produce or not. That the first thing. Second is that if it is going, if he is going to produce, then how much to produce. <coughs> then third is what input combinations are to, to be used by him, and what type of technology is to be used by him. So we shall begin with a general discussion of the concept of production function. And we will discuss about the production function. Then what type of with one variable, one variable for input with two variable input. Then uh, optimal combinations of inputs returns to scale. Functional forms of production function. Managerial uses of production function. We are also going to study at what point the producer is going to produce because all the points are not economically efficient. So production function is the functional relationship. If you are taking so many form variables like x1 up to xn, it actually q is a function of x1, x2 up to xn. If there are n variables, n inputs, then q is the maximum quantity of output, and x1 up to xn are various um, inputs. F stands for function. Now, for the sake of clarity, let us restrict our attention to functions of two variables. That is, one is labor input. And the second one is capital input. If there are only two inputs, capital K and labor L, we will write the production function as Q is equal to F L K. That is, output is a function of labor and capital. This function defines the maximum rate of output obtainable for a given rate of capital and labor input. It may be noted here that output may outputs may be tangible like computers, television sets, etc., which can be seen in our eye in our eyes, and it can be intangible, that is uh, like education, medic medical care, etc. Similarly, the inputs may be other than capital and labor, but for simplification, we have kept capital and labor as the as the two inputs for the for the producing one particular type of output. <coughs> Now here, uh, we would like to discuss about economic efficiency and technical efficiency. There is a lot of difference between economic efficiency and technical efficiency. A farm may be technical efficient, technically efficient, but may not be economically efficient. So a farm is technically efficient when it obtains maximum level of output from a given combination of inputs okay now the production function incorporates the technically efficient methods of production so whenever we are discussing about production function from economics point of view you have to remember that whatever methods of production those methods of productions are technically possible or technically efficient a producer cannot decrease one input at the same time maintain the output at the same level without increasing one or more inputs so when economists use production function, they assume <coughs> that the maximum output is obtained from any given combination of inputs. That is, they assume that the production by itself is technically efficient. On the other hand, we say a farm is economically efficient. That means if the farm produces a given amount of output at the lowest possible cost for the combination of capital and labor provided the price of capital and labor are given. So basically look at the differences here. Economically efficient is possible. A farm will be economically efficient when the farm is producing a given amount of output at the lowest possible of cost. 
um, that means PKPL remaining constant, he has to use some amount of input to combinations of K and L such that <coughs> he is going to get a given amount of output at the lowest cost. So when only input combinations are given, we deal with the problem of technical efficiency. That is how to produce maximum output. On the other hand, when input prices are also given, in addition to the combination of inputs, we deal with the problem of economic efficiency. That is how to produce a given amount of output at the lowest possible cost. One has to be very careful while interpreting whether a production process is efficient or inefficient. So certainly a production process can be called efficient if another process produces the same level of output using one or more inputs, other things remaining constant. However, if a production, production process uses less of some inputs and more of others then the economically efficient method of production a given producing a given level of output depends on the prices of inputs here the example means uh, suppose you are using capital and labor and suppose you are using less labor and more capital then we, we have to look at the economically efficient uh, production function because price of capital and price of labor, you have to judge those two prices also. Like an example, ABC company is producing ready-made garments using cotton fabric, found that 10% of the fabric is wasted in that process. Now what, what an engineer will do, engineer will suggest that wastage of fabric can be eliminated by modifying the present production process. So production process should be in such a way that or it should be changed so that that 10% fabric loss is going to be avoided. But to this suggestion, economist will react differently or a manager will react differently. How? Because the economist will weigh the cost of wasted fabric and the modification cost, that is modifying the production process. If the cost of wasted fabric is less than the cost of modification of the production process, then what will happen is that in that case, uh, sorry, if the cost of wasted fabric is more than that of the modifying production process, then it may not be, sorry, that's a mistake there, more than the modifying production process, then it may not be economically efficient to modify the production process. So here the idea is that if you are modifying the production process, you are incurring some cost. Now, if I'm modifying that production process, to absorb this 10% fabric that is wasted, then we have to look at that. Suppose we had wasted that 10%, what would have been the cost? Now that cost will be compared. Now if from modifying a production process, if that incurs a lot of um, money, that um, the producer has to incur a lot of cost, then the producer may not go for that particular uh, combination. So technical um, process and um, your economic e technical efficiency and economic efficiency are <coughs> both are two different things because economic efficiency involves prices of inputs. For that reason, the producer has to be careful. Now again, we have always in economics, uh, whenever we discuss about production function, we discuss about short term and long term. Short term and long run are based upon the types of inputs. There are two types of inputs. One is fixed input, the other one is variable input. A fixed input is one whose quantity cannot be varied during the time under consideration. Remember, short and long, there is no basic difference between that, these two because it depends upon the circumstances. Sometimes short period may be one day, short period may be uh, 10 days, depending on what type of production you are uh, doing. That, was, that is also there. So there is no uh, short run time and long run time which can be defined that this is the short run or this is the long run. We can say that the short run time period is that time period where some factors cannot be changed or some factors have to remain constant or at least one factor at least one factor remains unchanged and that is a short period in the longer period in the long run all the factors have to be changed and in our example since we are taking capital and labor and we are saying that capital is fixed labor is changing over a time period, then we can say that in short run, capital is fixed. That's just short run period. But suppose both capital and labor are changing, then we are saying that period is a long period. That is that means basically the inputs are classified as fixed if they cannot change immediately. 
Now they include usually, usually they include branch machinery and equipments of the farms, which take time to be um, changed, to be changed. Now a valuable input is one whose amount can be changed during the relevant period. What is the relevant period? That's the period which is short enough where uh, the other factors cannot be changed. Only one or two inputs can be varied, can be varied. So example in the construction business, the number of workers can be increased or decreased on short notice. Maybe builder farms, um, many builder farms employ workers on a daily basis. <coughs> And frequent change in the number of workers is made depending upon the need. Now here this example is an example where the farmers, the building construction uh, like machines, construction uh, equipments are fixed but the number of workers can be varied. Okay. Now whether or not an input is fixed or variable depends upon the time period involved. The longer the length of the time period under consideration, the more likely is that the input will be variable and not fixed. Economists find it convenient to distinguish between short run and the long run. The short run is defined at that time period when some of the farm's input cannot be changed or are fixed. Since it is very difficult to change plant and equipment among all inputs, the short run is generally accepted as the time interval over which the farm's plant and equipment remain fixed. In contrast, the long run is that period over which all the farm's inputs are variable. In other words, the farm has the flexibility or he has the freedom to adjust or change its environment. He can change the combination of capital and labor if both are variable. Production process of farms generally permit a variation in the proportion in which inputs are used in the long run. Input proportions can be varied, con varied considerably. Now let me not go through this example. You can go through this example from your book. Now the idea here is that in the, in the long run that is uh, and there are a very few production processes in which inputs have to be combined in a fixed proportion. Like Ranbaxi the example is their pharmaceutical farm. They are to produce a drug. The farm may have to use a fixed amount of aspirin for 10 gram of the drug. In this case, this cannot be changed. That is, that is the combination of these two. But the labor can be changed. The capital can be changed in the long run. So no flexibility in the ratio of input is possible. The technology is described as fixed proportion type. But this example actually is not is a not example of uh, uh, where inputs uh, um, inputs uh, in proper sense in economic sense. In economic sense, we take inputs as labor and capital. Okay, so fixed proportion means proportion of inputs, capital and labor ratio is not going to be changed. That is the idea. Now it will come to, <coughs> sorry, will come for production function with one variable input. That means one factor is fixed and the other factor is variable. If we are taking two input production process, so let there one input be fixed quantity, the other input may be with a variable quantity. Now we can write down the production function like the machine tools capital is fixed and labor is the um, variable factor. Now Q is the output of metal parts and K is the service of say five machine tools in our example in the book and that is the fixed and labor. The variable input can be combined with the fixed input to produce different levels of output. Like one labor is producing uh, two um, one per two metal parts per day, then four labors are producing eight metals per, metal parts per day. Then if you are increasing those labors um, over the time or the tomorrow, day after tomorrow, then they will be producing more. It is like that. Now suppose the metal parts company decides to know the output level for different input levels of the labor using fixed five machine tools. Now table below, we'll go for that table. Let us see the table. Here, we have this uh, number of workers, first column, second column is total output, thousands per year, third column is the marginal product of labor because your capital is fixed, average product that is APL. So APL, average product is the total quantity of output divided by total number of labor. That is why it is written as QYL and marginal product is one additional unit of output divided by one additional unit of labor. That is why delta by delta L. Now look at the table, what you find that 1 to 8 
as the number of workers are increasing, the total product is increasing 0 to 10, 28, 54, 76, 90, 96, 96, 92. Now look at the average product. Average product is actually 10 by 1. Then uh, next is your uh, total product is 28, 28 by 2, 14, 54 by 3, 18, 76 by 4, 19 and so on. You find that average product is increasing up to 19. Then it is falling. 18, 16, 13.5 and 11.5. Similarly, look at the marginal product figure. What is happening? Marginal product is also increasing up to the third, uh, up to the employment of third unit of uh, worker, third worker and that is 26. After that, it is falling. And again, look at the marginal product and average product. You find that in the beginning, Marginal product is higher than average product. But after that red thing, look at the figure. Marginal product is becoming, it is actually less than the average product. Now, what is the, that the red band uh, denotes? And that means here, that is what is happening. That marginal product is higher than average product till that point. Marginal product is higher than uh, average product and average product is highest at that point, 19. 19 is the average product which is highest at that point. So for MP4, I have given the left hand side, I have given the information regarding this table. So you can find out that total product is increasing then becoming a constant at uh, 6 it is 96 96 at the seventh unit of worker it is 96 again so it is remaining constant now ap and mp relationship you see that in the beginning mp is higher than ap and towards the end mp is less than mp ap sorry now uh, ap is highest at the fourth unit at the use of fourth unit of worker and MP is higher than AP at that point. So what do we find that APL, here we are discussing since labor is the variable factor. We are discussing about uh, average productivity of labor. So average product or average productivity of labor first rises, reaches maximum at 19 and then declines thereafter. Similarly, the marginal product of labor is the additional output that is also rising, then remaining at high at a particular point, then uh, it is actually marginal product, then it is actually falling. Now, for MP4, look at that marginal product of fourth worker, that is 76 minus 54, that is the change in output and change in labor is equal to 1, that is why MP4 is equal to del Q by del L, that is 22. Now here, although the marginal product fast increases with addition of workers, it declines later and it let, declines later and the addition of the eighth worker, actually the marginal product has become negative for off labor. At the seventh worker, marginal product has become uh, zero. That means it's not adding to the total product. Now look at this in terms of graph. So looking at the graph, look at the point X on the upper part of the graph. Point X is the point where total product up to point X from origin to X, total product was increasing at an increasing rate. Then after that, total product is increasing at a decreasing rate. That point is called point of inflation. inflection. Now at that point, what do you find in the second graph? Marginal product is maximum. That point, marginal product is maximum. And marginal product and average products are intersecting each other when average product is maximum, look at the diagram there, that is 4.5. At 4.5, uh, average product is equal to marginal product and marginal product is, um, before that marginal product is higher than average product. Then when uh, the producer goes on increasing the production of output and when it produces the seventh unit of output, marginal product becomes zero. Now at that point, total product is highest. Look at the point Z there. Total point, no, total product is highest. So when marginal product is equal to zero, total product will be highest. We are discussing about one variable input. That means uh, other variable is fixed, other uh, input is fixed and we are talking about variable uh, that is labor or workers. Now what will happen is that in this there are three stages that we will discuss later. Now look at this left hand side, the table, I mean the information. If marginal product is greater than zero, 
TP will be rising as L increases. Okay. Now, if marginal product is equal to zero, TP will be constant or TP will not rise. That is the highest one. Is constant between workers six and seven. If marginal product is less than zero, that is negative. After seven, that is negative. TP is declining. After Z, TP is declining. So, if MP intersects AP at the equality point, MP is equal to AP at the maximum point of the AP curve. This occurs at labor in, input rate 4.5. Also observe that whenever MP is greater than AP, AP is rising and uh, it makes no difference whether MP is rising or falling. When Whenever MP is less than AP towards the third stage 2, you find that AP is falling. That is, it is MP curve is below the AP curve. Since AP is positively or negatively sloped, depending on whether MP is above or below AP, it follows that MP is equal to AP at the highest point of the uh, AP curve. Now look at these three stages. That is stage one. Stage one is actually ending at the point where average product is maximum. Then stage two starts from that point and it goes up to the point where marginal product is equal to zero. Then stage three starts when marginal product is negative and total product is falling. Just remember these three stages. We'll come back to this slide net later on. And the relationship between MP and AP is not unique to economics. It happens in every field. In the book, you have example, considering the say that it's Sachin Tendulkar's example. Please go through that and you'll find that the relation, whatever in economics we're talking about, the relationship between AP and MP, that is actually not unique to economics. That is actually, and that is applicable to all sectors. That is applicable to all sectors. Now, one of the important things from this diagram and from this table, what we find is that that is known as the law of diminishing marginal returns. It is also known as the law of variable proportions. It is also known as the law of variable proportions. The so slope of the MP curve in the figure discussed earlier illustrates that important principle that is the law of diminishing marginal returns. Law of diminishing marginal returns. Now, the number of units of the variable input is increasing. So, other factor that is capital being fixed, being kept constant, there exists a point beyond which the marginal product of the variable input declines. It becoming zero, then it becomes negative. It be falling, then it is becoming zero, then it is becoming uh, negative. We can go back to the table, look at this table. We discussed that here. In this table, we discussed, look at the table and please follow your table and uh, look at the, what I'm saying, just look at the thing. Now, the table illustrates this law. Observe that NP was increasing up to the addition of the fourth worker. Please correspond to your table. Now, beyond that, NP is decreasing. What this law says is that MP may rise, MP means marginal productivity, may rise or stay constant for some time. But as we keep on increasing the units of variable input, marginal productivity or MP should start falling. It may keep falling and turn negative or may stay positive all the time. But usually the traditional way when we explain, we say that marginal product becomes zero, then it becomes negative. Now, uh, similarly, you can go for uh, other examples like fertilizer example in case of agriculture. Now, what is the situation here? Let us come back to the diagram here. Look at this diagram. You find that after the seventh unit of worker, the MP is falling and negative and AP is falling and that point also. First half, AP, MP all are rising and then um, MP is having a highest point, MP is falling, AP is rising the highest point, total product is increasing up to X at an increasing rate, it is increasing up to Y at a decreasing rate from X to Y, then you can find out the stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. Now let us come back to these three things uh, should be noted concerning the law of diminishing marginal returns. This law is an empirical generalization. Empirical generalization means this law has been actually studied on the basis of data from the field. That is field data based. It is empirically proved or empirically generalized, not a deduction or theoretical concept or from physical or biological laws. It is assumption here is technology remains fixed because the law of diminishing marginal returns will 
operate only when the technology remains fixed. It cannot predict the effect of an additional unit of output so if for suppose a uh, technology is allowed to change. Like suppose uh, in mobile business technology is changing quickly, in that case law of diminishing marginal returns may not apply. So the assumption is that technology is fixed. Now let us look at the stages of production. So based on the behavior of marginal product and average product, economists have classified production into three stages. Stage one, marginal product is positive, that is greater than zero. AP is rising, look at the diagram, AP is rising. Thus marginal product is greater than average product. Stage two, marginal product is positive, but AP is falling. Marginal product is less than AP, but TP is increasing. Now stage three, MP, MP is less than zero and AP, TP is falling. Stage one, actually it can be extended up to AP, MP is in the greater than AP. Then later on, AP is going, AP is actually achieving the maximum point, reaching the maximum point up to that is the stage one. So stage one, stage two, stage three. Now these results are illustrated in the uh, figure that is uh, the diagram I showed you earlier. This is the diagram. Here, no producer is going to produce in stage three. That is everybody is clear. The producer will start producing. It will go on producing till seventh unit of labor is used. And out the on that side output is actually uh, output is in our this example is 96. But here in diagram it is actually showing more than 96, almost 96. So what will happen is that the producer will not produce in the third stage where marginal productivity of labor is negative. So what he will do, he will produce only in the second stage of production. So that is in stage one, by adding one more unit of labor, the producer can increase the average product of all units. Thus, it would be unwise or it is, it is illogical for the producer to stop production in first stage. As for stage three, it does not pay. So stage three is not going to be um, attended, not going to be disturbed. Um, are going to be uh, considered by the funds. Now stage two is the economically meaningful range. That is the stage two. In this stage, first starts from the point of, in the diagram at the point of inflection. We saw earlier that MP is maximized at point Y. Since AP is maximized, we have AP is equal to MP at point Z. TP reaches maximum. So MP is equal to zero at this point. For the right hand side, you find MP is equal to zero. Up to that point, it is the stage two. If the variable input is free, then the optimum level of output is at point Z, where TP is maximized. Please uh, refer to the diagram. Now, in practice, actually what happens? No input will be freely available. What we discussed till now is that if we are increasing labor, then output is increasing. But we didn't discuss about the price of labor. If the price of labor is very costly, it is very pricey, then in that case, what the producer will do. So whatever we discussed till now, it was actually we thought that or we gave the idea that inputs are freely available. But actually in practice, no input will be freely available. Every producer has to pay a price for this. So for that reason, what will happen is that in this case, producer will keep on hiring additional worker as long as price of an additional unit of output, whatever that additional labor is producing, that is additional unit of output multiplied by marginal product of labor must be greater than price of a unit of labor. In our example, suppose the payment is 200 per worker and output one apple is equal to rupees 10. So one extra output apple 10 rupees multiplied by uh, one sorry one uh, extra unit of labor rupees 10 multiplied by extra units of apple produced by that additional labor is if that is greater than 200 then the producer will produce that is known as marginal revenue of product 
लेफ्ट हैंड साइड इज नोन एज एम आर पी और मार्जिनल रेवेन्यू और प्रोडक्ट ऑफ लेबर इफ दैट इज ग्रेटर देन पी एल सो वट इज मार्जिनल रेवेन्यू प्रोडक्ट ऑफ लेबर दैट इज प्राइस ऑफ वन एडिशनल यूनिट ऑफ द प्रोडक्ट आउटपुट मल्टीप्लाइड बाई द मार्जिनल प्रोडक्ट ऑफ द लेबर दैट एडिशनल लेबर दैट मस्ट बी ग्रेटर देन प्राइस ऑफ लेबर ऑन ए सिमिलर एनोलॉजी वी कैन से लेबर इज फिक्स एंड कैपिटल इज चेंजिंग इन दैट केस वी ऑल्सो कैन से दैट द एम आर पी ऑफ कैपिटल that is must be greater than pk okay the left side the left side means the mrp side denotes the increase in revenue and the right side that is denotes the increase in the cost of adding one more unit of labor because for labor we are paying some price that is the cost as long as the increment to revenues exceeds the increment to the cost the profit of the farm producer will uh, increase and remember in the last class in the beginning the traditional economic theory always sets producers as rational because they will be uh, always working with a profit motive so as long as increment to revenue in exceeds the increment to cost the profits of the producer is will, will go, is going to increase now as we increase as we increase the unit of labor we see that mp diminishes we see that mp diminishes we assume that the prices of inputs and outputs do not change let us say price of labor uh, capital is not changing and output also not changing in this case what will happen is if that is the assumption we already have studied that you know, one extra unit of labor the marginal productivity is declining at the law of diminishing marginal return the marginal product that we have already said now suppose price of labor is fixed output of price of output is also fixed in that case if a, even if mp is declining then what is happening mp is declining means mrp is falling or the revenue is falling and the cost is remaining constant if mp mrp is falling then then that is becoming less than the cost then the farmer the producer is not going to produce so at this point the producer will stop adding more unit of um, input with further addition since mp declines the additional would be less than the additional cost remember price of l remaining constant even if marginal product is falling then mrp is also falling left hand side okay now if that is the situation then the profit of the producer would decline so the profit maximization implies the producer with no control over the prices of labor and prices of output will increase the use of an input until value of marginal product vmp is equal to price of a unit of variable input or pl vmp l must be equal to pl now that is the that was the discussion about when producer was facing that is uh, we were discussing about um, one variable input the other variable other input uh, um, remaining constant now let us say if both capital and labor are varying or both are variable then the situation will be different the diagrams will be different and the explanation will also be different here the law that is going to operate is the law of returns to scale we will come to it that come to later on now what happens here is that we are restricting ourselves to two inputs again both are variable now analyzing this production with more than one variable input we cannot simply use the concept of ap and mp curves like we used earlier now because these curves were derived holding the use of all other inputs fixed and letting the use of only one input vary now since capital and labor both are varying the producer may take more capital and less labor more labor and less capital whatever is suitable for him now this now what will happen is that if you are varying the labor it is not that capital is remaining fixed so for that reason those things will be discarded those things whatever we discussed earlier now that is applicable for one variable input only now in this case what will happen is that inputs changing the use of one input uh, in case of two variable inputs changing the use of one input would cause a shift in the mp and ap curves of the other input for example increase in capital would probably result in an increase in the marginal productivity of labor over a wide range of labor use now here the concept of isoquant is coming that is production isoquant a production isoquant is the locus of 
all those combinations of two inputs capital and labor which yields a given level of output remember outputs can be quantified output can be 50 units can be 100 units like that unlike consumption where out on the indifference curves um, you cannot give value here you can give values to the um, isoquants so a production isoquant is the locus of all these combinations of two inputs which yield a given level of output so with two variable inputs capital and labor the isoquants give the different combinations of capital and labor that produces the same level of output for example suppose the amount of output is equal to 5 that can be produced by using either 15 of k or 2 of labor or 10 of k and 3 of labor or 5 of k and 5 of labor look at the thing what is happening when capital is uh, being reduced labor is being added that is the thing if you are reducing capital labor remaining fixed you are not going to achieve the same output you have to increase your labor so what is happening capital is slowly increasing labor uh, sorry capital is slowly decreasing and labor is slowly increasing to produce the same unit of output that is five so these four combinations of capital and labor are four points on the iso points associated with five units of output which i am going to show you now now let us assume that capital and labor are continuously divisible you can take uh, one unit of capital you can take 1.5 units of capital you can take 1.25 units of capital you can take 1.00001 unit of capital that is the concept of divisibility so we assume that capital and labor are continuously divisible so there would be many more combinations on this isoquant now let us assume capital labor and output are continuously divisible in order to set for the production isoquant or the characteristics of isoquants look at this right hand side uh, <coughs> the diagram of an isoquant upper one that is for q is equal to 5 lower one q1 10 q2 15 q3 20 that means a higher isoquant represents higher quantity of output and number one diagram upper part of the diagram if i look at the diagram when the capital is being reduced labor is actually increasing labor is increasing to produce the same level of output that is five so according to isoquant one uh, that is q1 is equal to uh, 10 isoquant one shows that all the combinations of capital and labor that will produce 10 units of um, output now according to this out uh, this uh, isoquant k2 k0 l0 is one combination k1 l1 is one combination k2 k l2 is another combination now when capital is falling labor is increasing and uh, we are finding that on all the three points the combination the coordinates of these three points are on same curve that is q1 so isoquant 2 shows higher level that means you just uh, um, extend the k2 to the second one and naturally you will be getting more output that is the higher isoquant represents higher amount of iso higher amount of out output since we have assumed that output and inputs all are divisible then we can say an infinite number of isoquants could be drawn that is known as a isoquant map that is known as isoquant map now remember two isoquants cannot intersect each other they cannot intersect each other because that will go against our assumption that means if they are intersecting each other at one point same amount of labor more amount of capital same amount of labor less amount of capital is giving you the same output that is not possible now regarding the isoquants so lastly we can say production function q0 is a function of capital and labor and here both are variable capital is variable labor is variable the earlier one you can write down q0 function k bar l k bar means capital remains constant and l is variable now look at the right hand side that is the diagram and just observe it carefully what is happening to the change in labor what is happening to the change in labor for change in capital now that concept is called marginal rate of technical substitution so the rate at which one input can be substituted for another input if output remains constant is called the marginal rate of technical substitution or MRTS. 
it is this divide it is actually the slope of the isoquant it is the slope of the isoquant so slope of any curve slope of and i forgot to tell you isoquants are strictly convex curves in our everyday um, economics they are strictly convex curves and what is happening here is that the slope of the isoquant is the vertical distance divided by the horizontal distance vertical distance is delta k and horizontal distance is delta l look at here when capital k is falling l is increasing but slope is negative but we don't have to take the slope we have to take the mod value so delta k by delta l that is the mrts l for k that means marginal rate of technical substitution of labor for capital okay now delta k by delta l is the uh, mod value of that is mrts that is a positive number and del delta k by delta l which is ordinarily the slope of the isoquant that is negative because capital is falling and labor is increasing that is why it is positive uh, um, negative but when we are talking about mrts that is the mod of the slope of the isoquant over the relevant range of production the mrts diminishes that is more and more labor is substituted for capital while holding output constant the absolute value of delta k by delta l decreases okay now look at this again marginal rate of technical substitution what do you find here the mrts of labor for capital between point a and b that is 2 that is uh, uh, 8 to 4 that is 4 and this is 2 4 by 2 that is uh, minus is the slope minus 4 by 2 is the slope mod value of that is 2 okay now the mrts is equal to 2 between points b and c similarly we can say that is 4 by 4 minus 2 4 minus 2 and this is becoming uh, 4 that is uh, 4 to 8 what is happening it is becoming half it is becoming half so mrts has decreased because capital and labor are not perfect substitutes for each other that is the major I reason why MRTS is decreasing that means when you are going to use more and more of labor then you are going to forego less and less of capital relatively that is why it is falling so MRTS has decreased because uh, the labor are not um, are not perfect substitutes for each other okay now therefore more labor is added less capital can be used while keeping the output level constant a b c all are giving you the same output here all are giving you the same output there is a simple relationship between mrts of labor for capital and the marginal product mpk and mpl since along an isoquant the level of output remains constant if delta l units of labor are substituted for delta k units of capital the increase in output due to delta l units of labor that is delta l multiplied by mpl it should be equal to the units of output that is decreased due to decrease in delta k that is delta k multiplied by marginal productivity of k they should be equal to equal to each other because uh, we have said that the change from a to b like suppose you are going from a to b the change is zero basically the change is zero that means delta l multiplied by marginal productivity of labor must be equal to delta k into marginal productivity of capital which is equal to you take the mod value then that is becoming mrts l for k that is the ratio of marginal product of labor and marginal product of capital so marginal rate of technical substitution is the mod value of the slope of the isoquant it decreases because both the goods both the inputs are not perfect substitutes and they can be expressed in terms of the ratios of marginal productivity of labor that is the horizontal side and marginal productivity of capital now this is the idea now let us discuss three uh, generally three uh, um, different types of isoquant last one is the usual we know that convex isoquants first two let us discuss in panel one the isoquants are actually right angles that is a 90 degree angle here what happens actually a b are used in a fixed proportion for that reason the isoquants are like this suppose you are saying one cup for one cup of coffee you need one cup uh, one spoon uh, coffee plus two spoons sugar then you suppose you have three spoons of sugar and one spoon of coffee then you cannot produce 
more than one you have to produce one cup of coffee with one spoon coffee and two spoons of sugar one that extra spoon of sugar is useless so for that that means at least you have to get one more spoon of sugar so that you can increase your production to two cups of coffee that is the basic idea so two inputs a and b must be used in fixed proportion if they are used in fixed proportion then in that case isoquant uh, um, nature of the isoquants or the uh, diagram of the isoquants will be like this 90 degree right angles okay now in this case mrts is usually equal to zero MRTS is equal to 0. Now the other extreme case is parallel. In that case, what is happening? There are straight lines and uh, not parallel. There are straight lines Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2 are parallel. Now here what happens? A, B are perfect substitutes. Input A and input B. If both are perfect substitutes, then the isoquants will be like a straight line. Now here the marginal rate of technical this is their straight line slope of the straight line is constant and MRTS is nothing but the mod value of the slope. Now that will also remain constant. So MRTS in all this case will remain um, constant slope. Now the third one is the most common which I have already discussed that is because the behavior of this isoquant is because, because of the fact that input A and input B are uh, actually uh, imperfect soft in substitutes for each other. Now let us come to the point where exactly when both the inputs are variable where exactly the producer is going to produce. Now look at the diagram OA is one ridge line that is known as ridge line R I D G E ridge line OB is another ridge line. These two ridge lines represents like OA uh, OA line is bound OA line is the locus of all points where marginal product of capital is zero okay now similarly ob is the ridge line for which is the locus of all points where marginal product of labor is zero now just think of to the left of oa to the left of oa marginal productivity of uh, capital is going to be negative and to the right of ob outside of ob you find that marginal productivity of labor is becoming negative and we know that the one of the inputs is giving you negative returns then the producer is not going to produce so the producer is going to produce in that area where marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital both are positive that is possible between oa and ob so the producer will choose that portion of isoquant which is coming between these two ridge lines OA and OB, the rational producer. Because to the left of OA, marginal MPK is negative. To the right of OB, towards uh, the x-axis, that is the MPL is negative. And to the left of OA, towards y-axis, MPK is negative. In between that, these two, um, the line bounded, the area bounded by OA and OB, that is the area where the production is going to take place. Now, above OA and below OB, the slope of the isoquant is positive. That and the slope is also becoming positive beyond that. That is also another point. Slope is beyond that, slope is positive, but marginal product is also going to be negative. Marginal product of one K or L is going to be negative. So the region of production is um, the region of production is beyond the ridge lines are economically inefficient and region between the these lines are economically efficient. The producer is going to produce there only. Now, what is the optimal combination of inputs? Any desired level of output can be produced in our example. Now, what will, uh, which combination is to be taken by the, taken up by the producer? Now the price comes into the picture. Price of labor and price of capital comes to the picture. If price is there, you have to buy them or you have to use them, you have to buy them. That means you have to spend money. That is known as cost. So now this region is perfectly okay. The producer can produce anywhere. The producer can produce at the third ISO point, highest ISO point. But what is the product's producer's cost level? That is important. So the optimal combinations, the final decision to employ a particular input combination is purely an economic decision and it rests on cost or expenditure. Thus, the production manager can make 
either uh, of the following two input choices yields maximum level of output with a given level of expenditure or leads the lowest cost of producing a given level of output so this way that this going to be going to and this is the isocost line isocost line is the the line it is the slope that is slope will be suppose everything is spent on capital nothing on l then it will be the total amount of capital will be c by p k and suppose everything is spent on labor nothing on capital then it will be total amount of labor will be c by p l so now you join these two points you are getting iso cost that is the iso cost line that means the producer cannot produce beyond ab line because his cost of production cannot cover that like point 10 the producer cannot attain that because his cost of production is much below that now at point p the producer can cover that cost but actually some money will be left with him he can go to a further production which is on ab so the producer's iso cost line ab all this slope of this line is pl by pk that is uh, vertical distance by um, that is vertical distance by your uh, uh, horizontal distance c by pk into c by pl or c by pk uh, not into c by pk divided by c by pl c by pk sorry this is the wrong thing i have done it c by pk divided by c by pl divided by c by pl then that is pl by pk that is your vertical distance divided by the horizontal this that is a mistake i have done there c by pk divided by c by pl is equal to pl by pk that is the slope of isocost line now this is the example i took but you can look at this isocost line can um, behave differently depending upon the uh, dip, um, changes in price of inputs suppose there is a decrease in price of labor then the isocost line um, will go outside outside because more labor can be bought pk remaining unchanged suppose there is an increase in price of capital then what will happen is that in the beginning suppose this particular example let us say that it is starting from 10 to 10 so 10 to 20 that is the original now if the price of labor is increasing the person is going to buy less labor k is remaining constant kc will be the new iso cost line if the price of labor is decreasing then it will be beyond ab towards the right of ab without k um, pk remaining unchanged now suppose price of capital is changing then lower person b will remain unchanged upper person k will if price of capital is high it will come down and if price of capital is low it will go up so iso cost lines can be can be uh, can be changed depending on price of labor and price of capital now but suppose the income total budget is changed then the iso cost line will move parallelly that you can do on by yourself that will move on parallelly now what is the optimal combination of input we have iso cost line we have iso quants now what is the motive motive is to maximize the profit now in this situation what will happen is that if both capital and labor are variable then determining the optimal input rates of capital and labor requires the technical information from the production function that is the iso quant be combined with market data on input prices that is the iso cost function now we superimpose the iso cost line in the iso quant map then we will get the iso quant line which is tangent to the highest possible iso quant that will be the equilibrium point let us look at this diagram here what is happening here is that the iso cost line is suppose um, we will take the right hand side one upper one that is actually contingent to 100 so output production will be 100 l1 amount of labor and k1 amount of capital will be uh, utilized by the by the um, by the farm now suppose we are saying that uh, <coughs> this is the isocon map so isocon uh, that is tangent there a uh, and let us take another lower that is one uh, output uh, isocon is available that is 50 one isocon is available then that is tangent to the isocost line with the isocost line will move downward and that is tangent to the isocost line at point z now z ab what are the points 
AZ, we all are giving us equal 50, 50 units of output. But at Z, what is happening? You are using the least cost. You are using the least cost. At A, you are going, uh, A and B are on a higher ISO cost line. And Z point is at a lower ISO cost line. Similarly, if uh, the point uh, upper most uh, on the right, right hand bound uh, ISO cost line is tangent, you can find out A, B are the point where it is actually having less output compared to 100 units of output. So both ways you can say that maximizing output subject to a given cost that is possible isocon map is given and the isocon iso cost line is tangent to the highest possible iso point that is the equilibrium level suppose the cost is here in this case cost is given isocon map is given suppose one iso point is given in that case the producer will go for that iso cost or that cost which is minimum that is again possible the iso cost line which is tangent to the Long. I have given ISO call the ISO lowest ISO cost line which is tangent to the given ISO point. So two possibilities are there. So regardless of the production objective, efficient production requires that the ISO point should be tangent to the ISO cost function. Now here this efficiency condition also holds good. Now uh, the marginal, uh, we can go back to the figure 7.9 and look at this the marginal product of capital per rupee spent on capital is equal to the marginal product of labor per rupee spent on labor at point q that is the equilibrium point here okay that is mp we can say mpl by pl is equal to mpk by pk or you can say slope of the iso point is equal to slope of the iso cost line slope of the iso point means mod value of the slope of the iso point is equal to uh, pl by pk now in this case you can say both ways you can explain that is mathematically you can say uh, slope mpl by pl is equal to mpk by pk and uh, so on and you can uh, discuss these points and uh, if they are actually more than less than you can also find out and the problem is to minimize cost for a given level of output which i discussed just now that is corresponding to 50 units of output the spar will move from b to z okay now this is the idea about the equilibrium situation so the input combination that yields the maximum level of output with a given level of expenditure and the input combination that leads to the lowest cost of production uh, a given level of output are satisfied in this case now i'm not going through this now returns to scale returns to scale remember look at will come straight here an example panel a here the distance c a is equal to a b is equal to b c now this is a constant returns to scale that means the proportionate change in output is equal to the proportionate change in inputs. That is the constant returns to scale. In case of increasing returns to scale, what will happen is that the proportionate change in output is more than the proportionate change in the input. If there is a 25% change in input and the output is changing by 50%, then that is the case of increasing returns to scale. And in case of decreasing returns to scale, the proportionate change in output, if that is less than the proportionate change in input, then that is the case of decreasing returns to scale. While showing it in the diagram, what we are showing in the second one, 50, 150, gap is 50. That means same amount of output, additional output can be produced with less amount of input that is the idea and third one just look at this here oa is less than uh, sorry that is written ca my mistake it is written ca oa is less than ab is less than bc that means here you are producing that is 50 50 for extra 50 production you are you are having more than proportionate increase in your input so this is the basic idea that is uh, about the returns to scale returns to scale concept is in case of uh, uh, when the situation where the, both the inputs are variable now there are functional forms of uh, uh, production function one major production function is 
Kirk Douglas production function. That is the May one of the very uh, you very much used function of the glass production function and if alpha plus beta is equal to greater than one increasing returns to scale alpha plus beta is equal to one constant returns to scale alpha plus beta is less than one and that gives you the decreasing returns to scale and we can calculate the marginal productivity of labor by taking the derivative of that now cobbler's production function does not lend itself directly to estimation by the regression methods so we have to go for regression methods we have to convert it to logarithm form now this function since it is a linear form it can be used for regression purpose so now let us say what are the types of statistical analysis available time series analysis cross section analysis and engineering analysis three types of analysis are available now here time series analysis what exactly i will give you the gist that you have the past data then you are regressing that data on future you are forecasting therefore that is the basic idea behind the uh, time series data it is appropriate for a single farm that has not undergone significant changes in technology during the time span analyzed so time series data you have the data then on the you are regressing that data and you are fitting a trend what is going to happen in future suppose i am entering to the market then what should be the total product how much i should produce what should be the value of that market uh, value of that product these things are actually used uh, in case of time series data is helpful in that case now it is not appropriate for estimating the production function of a farm that has gone through significant technological change if the farms are going through significant technological change in that case it is not applicable similarly there is cross section analysis cross section analysis at a point of time what is happening to the data at a point of time not over a time period like the like the time series data now here for a particular year we are going for various raw materials used in various farms of steel industry in the year 2020 that is a cross section analysis you can analyze cross section go for cross section analysis engineering analysis is another way of using this that is it's undertaken when the above two types are not sufficient to look at the um, look at the problems now let us come to the limitations limitations you can read by yourself because limitations uh, um, that the, the main uh, i mean um, you can study and you can write down those things then what are the managerial uses of production function managerial uses of production function are useful actually in deciding on the additional value of employing a variable input or not in the production process that is the one of the most, most important uh, aspects of production function and it also can be used to compute the least cost combination what should be the total input for a given production function or a given output what should be the least cost that is possible for a given amount of output so long as the marginal revenue productivity mrp is exceeding its price then it is worthwhile for the manager to increase it now production functions also aid in long run decision making so if returns to scale are increasing it will be worthwhile to increase production through a proportionate increase in all factors of production okay now uh, returns to scale are decreasing it may not be worthwhile this this is okay i mean this is okay now summary we all discussed about i or discussed about everything that is production function one variable case two variable case then law of variable proportion then law of diminishing um, that is uh, law of diminishing returns to scale then um, how the equilibrium is happening in case of two variable inputs then how the least cost combination is going to be taken up by the producers and uh, all these things i uh, told you and i think it will be sufficient for you to understand and go through the book and uh, can read on your own i have just taken used your book go through your book and uh, please uh, listen to my class and read it thank you